You may not be aware that today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. You know, in this country, we don't think about that a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of persecution here about being a Christian. Oh, there may be some ridicule. Oh, there may be some, you know, funny looks or some comments here or there. But persecution? No, not really. One October morning in 2006, a woman and her six children were forced to witness an attack on their husband and father. His assailants tried to force him to deny Jesus, but he refused. He continued to proclaim Christ as Lord and died praying for his family. The family is determined to follow Christ, even in their gr grief. Why don't you be seated while I share with this with you for a moment. Another man was sentenced to three years in prison for allegedly insulting another religion. He's an outspoken Christian with a passion for Christ. He and his wife and children continue to be faithful and refuse to deny him. Persecution for the Christian faith is as real in our world as it was for the Jewish believers in the early church to whom Peter wrote. He prayed, May the God of all grace, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And so as we have our time of prayer here this morning, one of the things we are going to do is pray for the Christians around the world that are suffering persecution. And uh, they've given us some uh, guidelines to pray for this morning. Number one, pray for the safety and faith of the secret believers in country where, countries where it is illegal to share about Christ. And there are many countries like that. It's illegal to share about Christ, and they must meet in secret. So pray for their safety and faith. Number two, pray for the health, perseverance, and encouragement of believers who are imprisoned for the gospel. There's so many reasons for people to be in prison and sharing Christianity is not one of those. But there are people around the world that are in prisons simply for their faith. Number three, pray for those whose loved ones have died due to martyrdom, that they will rely on God for their strength. So let's pray that the church around the world that are suffering persecution, that they will be strengthened and encourage individually and their families to remain strong in their faith. We just don't realize how good we've got it here to live in a country that's free and that we can freely worship anyone at any time without any persecution. I do believe, Father, we are grateful this day for your love. We're grateful for your mercy and grace. We're thankful, Lord, that we do live in a country where this is not a concern. We freely worship you. We don't have to worry about the state police coming to take us away or to threaten us with death if we don't renounce you. But yet, Lord, I sometimes wonder if we are so complacent, if we're in such an easy state that our faith is cheap, our faith isn't very deep, and maybe a time of testing would be something that would be beneficial almost and Lord there are many that are dealing with that around the world that are being persecuted that are being killed that are in prison that are suffering um, suffering for you and so Lord we pray specifically for them today on this specific day that's set aside to do that we pray for the persecuted church around the world we pray that you would keep them safe that you would continue to grow their faith that you would encourage and sustain them as they're in prison, that you would bless their families and the families that have lost loved ones because of their faith, and that you would sustain them as well. Lord, we are, we are truly blessed here this morning. May we not take that lightly. May we not take it for granted but may we bless you and praise your name. And Lord, for those needs that are in our hearts here today, and I'm sure there are many of those, we also lift those to you and ask that you would bless. Lord, I'm sure that there's needs for healing. 
I'm sure there's needs for relationships to be blessed and to be better. I'm sure there's needs for financial blessings, for physical healing and feeling better, for emotional needs, and yes, for spiritual needs, to know you better, to draw closer to you. And we lift up all of those needs as we share them in our hearts and minds right now. We pray that you would just meet all of those needs. And right now we pray that you would speak through your servant, that we may hear your message, hear your gospel, and be encouraged and strengthened by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It seems odd not dismissing the children at this time, that they're already gone for children's church or for children's musical rehearsal, and so I don't have to do that. Get into habits, though. Today we're going to continue on. In fact, we're going to complete, at least I hope to anyway, we're going to complete James here today. We're going to finish up James chapter 4, verses 11 is where we're going to be starting. If you want to turn there in your Bible, James 4, 11, and I hope to complete all the way through the end of James. And then next week, Two weeks from now, of course, is Thanksgiving, and so I'm going to have a Thanksgiving message coming up then, the Sunday before, as we have our all-church dinner. I hope you're looking forward to that, our time together as a church family, as we celebrate Thanksgiving together. And by the way, there is a, uh, a new feature that, uh, that Brenda Cootie came up with the idea. I love the idea. It's a wonderful idea, and we're going to be doing it. It's already uh, out there, if you haven't noticed it. On the Narthex bulletin, not the Narthex, but on the hallway in the bulletin board, there's a big paper that says where you can put things that you're thankful for. And that's a great way to start getting our minds set for Thanksgiving. What are you thankful for this morning? Who are you thankful for? How have you been blessed by God or blessed by others? And you have an opportunity to take a leaf, you know, since it's fall time, you know, take a leaf. And there's a pen there, and you can actually write on there uh, something that you want to give thanks to. Uh, it can be just to God for something that he has done. It can be to another person in the church for something that they've done to bless you. But take an opportunity to think about that. How have you been blessed by God or by others that you are thankful for this Thanksgiving? And take a moment to actually put it out on the board there and make that act of, of encouragement there. And so I want you to be aware of that. But I started to say all that to say that next week, uh, since I'm finishing James today and then Thanksgiving in two weeks, what am I going to do next week? Well, I figured we might as well give equal time to Jesus' other half-brother who wrote a book of the Bible, and that's Jude. And so we're going to be looking at the book of Jude next week. So if you want to, prepare yourself and get ready for that. You can read the book of Jude this coming week. It's not that long, and so we can get it done in one week, and so uh, that's where we're headed next week. But for today, James 4.11. We're going to read 11 and 12 first. Brothers, do not slander one another. See, this is not surprising that he would go there, because what's he just been talking about? Controlling the tongue? He's been talking about quarrels and fighting going on in the church and some of the reasons behind that. And a big part of the quarrels and the fights and, and controlling our tongue is involved with not making judgmental comments towards others. And so he writes, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So this is where I want you to really think. I want you to think about that question. Who are you to judge your neighbor? You see, when you're making comments about other people in the church, when you're starting those fights and quarrels, and that's the way they lots of times will start, is because you're gossiping about someone, you're talking about someone else, and, and that hurts feelings, and then it causes difficulties in, a, in the church setting. 
That basically is a judgment you're making against them when you're speaking against them. And who are you to judge? Who are you to speak against them? See, the thing is, you're going to be judged for what you're doing right then. And you need to be careful about that. You need to be understanding of that. And you need to not be doing that. Because God is the only one that has the right to make those kinds of judgments. So if you can't say something nice, as the phrase says, don't say anything at all, right? If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Keep your mouth quiet. You know, we just talked about godly wisdom. And he was sharing about the things that, that show that we have godly wisdom. Remember that was back in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18? Turn back there with me real quickly. 3, 17, and 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise, raise a harvest of righteousness. This is not the same conduct that James is talking about now, where we're speaking slander against each other. It is not showing that we are listening to God's wisdom or that we're obeying God's law because God's law is love one another. And you can't do that when you're slandering your brother or sister. You can't do that. That is not showing godly wisdom on our part. Remember the three questions I said that we need to ask ourselves before we start talking to others, especially talking about someone or talking to someone about some issue that we may have with them? What's the first question? Anybody remember? Is it true? Is the comment or the statement that you're about to make to someone, is it true? And what was the second one? Is it necessary? Hey, somebody's paying attention at least. That's good. Is it necessary? It may be true, but that doesn't mean it's necessary to talk to them about it or to say it to them. And the third thing is, is if you find that it's true, and if you find it's necessary to share with them about it, third thing you want to ask about what you're about to say is, is it kind? This side gets an A. I don't know where all the comments are coming from. You guys get an A over here. You're remembering it. They probably got their notes from last week or whatever. They, oh, there, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> fine. Is it true? Is it necessary? And then last, is it kind? And if you can't say anything nice and, and kind, then don't say anything at all. And even though it's not confrontational to talk to someone, because it is, if you're going to share with them something that you think they're doing wrong and that you need to confront them about, you need to do it with kindness. You need to do it in the way I've shared many times before, with carefrontation. Confront them with care, carefrontation. And when we do it with the right attitude, with the right purpose behind it, it will be accepted by the other much more readily. And it won't be considered slander. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. Let's continue on. Chapter uh, 4, verses 13 through the end of that chapter. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Again, this is following what James has just been talking about with worldly wisdom, the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of our society, the, world, the wisdom of, of the way most people in this world wants to live their life versus God's wisdom. Worldly wisdom, the wisdom of this world says that that's what we need to do. We need to be boasting about getting out there and doing great business and making a lot of money and that's our goal and that's our purpose and that's what we need to be doing. And James says, no, 
That's not what it's all about. Don't be boasting about that. Don't be bragging about your plans because you know what? You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know that you're even going to be living tomorrow. So when you are making all these boasts and all these plans without even thinking about God, that's worldly wisdom. You're not saying, you know, if the Lord blesses, if the Lord wills, if the Lord is with me, then, I, then I'll be able to do you know, some good business there. And maybe I can share about Jesus while he's there. But no, they're not that way. They're not thinking that way. They're always thinking selfishly. I'm going to go to the city. I'm going to stay there a year. I'm going to make a lot of money, and, and I'm going to do business. And they're making all these plans without even thinking about what God maybe has in plans, has in store for us. It really reminds me. And, and by the way, planning is okay. I'm not, James is not saying that we shouldn't make plans. We should make plans. We shouldn't just think, well, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, so I, I won't make any plans. I won't save for my future. I won't put any, any retirement away because I don't even know if I'll make it to retirement. No, he's not saying don't make any plans. Yes, you can plan, but realize that life is uncertain. That you're just a mist that appears for a while and then you're gone. And you don't know when that's going to happen. And so we need to serve God now. But where I started was, it's very reminiscent of back in Luke chapter 12, if you want to turn back there with me. In Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, where Jesus is telling a parable. Luke 12, 16 through 21. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. James is basically sharing a, that same concept. We need to be careful about the plans that we make, and we need to be careful that we are storing up the good things with God, and not just selfishly thinking, I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be doing that, I, 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 I. It's all selfish. And we don't even know what's going to happen. We need to be serving God. We need to be trusting God, not thinking that we can live independent of God. That's worldly wisdom. That's not godly wisdom. And then in thinking about that, that's when he uses, says that last verse, verse 17. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. We tend to think of sins as sins of action, what we do. But you know what? There are sins of inaction as well. We, some people use the word, it's sins of commission and the sins of omission. When we know what we should do and we just don't do it, when we feel God's prompting to do something, maybe do something nice for a neighbor, do something of talking to someone about Jesus, or whatever good thing that God may be prompting to you to do, and you know it's a good thing to do, and you just say, eh... I don't want to be bothered right now. That's a sin of omission. It's a sin of inaction. It's a sin of disobedience to God. And we need to be careful about those kinds of attitudes, those kinds of things. Again, we just don't know what's going to happen in this life. We can't necessarily make plans and think that we are in control. And that's the problem. That's the worldly attitude. I'm in control. When we are ignoring what God is, has to say and what God's will is, we're saying, I'm in control, I'll take care of it. I don't need you, God. And we don't know what's going to be ahead. We don't know if there's going to be an accident that's going to be happening. We don't know if there's a disease that we're going to get. Think of all the people that have died from swine flu. Do you think they planned for that? We just don't know what's going to happen. Life is so uncertain. Paul, many times in his writings, would say, if the Lord wills, 
I'll go to this place or I'll go to that place. Angelo Gonzalez, who many of you know who used to attend here, he had that phrase down. He would always say that. No matter what kind of plans he was making, he'd always say, if the Lord wills. It was a very prominent phrase that he would use. He took this seriously. He understood life is uncertain. And any good that I can do now and that I know God wants me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not going to sin in that way. Let's continue on in chapter 5. Now listen, you rich people. He's just been kind of talking about the fact that they've been, you know, buying into the world's wisdom about selfishness, getting out there and getting everything that they can for themselves, not even thinking about God. And so he says, now listen. You rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Now, is he speaking strictly that all rich people are evil? No. Again, don't get the wrong concept here. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that if you use your wealth in the way he's about to describe, uh, you better be ready to weep and wail. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. You know what? I forgot the video, didn't I? I was supposed to show a video here when I was talking about the fact that we make our plans and we want to do whatever we want to do without any thought of God. No, it's up ahead. It's up ahead. Okay, I was getting ahead of myself. Never mind me. (laughs) Don't plan. (laughs) If the Lord wills, we'll have the video in the right place. (laughs) Ah. your wealth has rotted verse 2 again your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes your gold and silver are corroded your corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire you have hoarded wealth in the last days look the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. That's the rich men that he's talking about. Those that have done those kinds of things, who did not pay the wages, they were dishonest in the way they've been conducting their business. Those are the ones. And he speaks to three specific forms of wealth that was going on in that day. It's not always the case in our our day, in our society today, but back then there were three major forms of wealth. One was food. As we just talked about the rich man, he got all these crops and he stored all these crops up. Wealth was, was established through food, through crops and grains that you could gather in. That was one of the forms of wealth. And if you just have food sitting around forever because it's more than you need, what happens to it? It rots. (laughs) We went to, uh, we went to do, Cheryl has some instant gravy mixes on a shelf in a cupboard, and we went to make some gravy the other day. And there was these, uh, black spots of seasoning in there that I had never noticed before. (laughs) And I'm pouring it out, and I'm going, I don't remember seeing those little black spots of seasoning in there before, and all of a sudden the black spots started moving. (laughs) So we just poured it in, and we figured the boiling would take care of it. No, no. (laughs) If you store food sitting around forever, something's going to happen to rot it out. And so that's one of the things that he's talking about. Your wealth has rotted, and that's what he's talking about, that food that you're storing up that's more than you even need, rather than sharing it with others, you're just storing it up, and it's just going to rot. And moths have eaten your clothes. See, that was the other form of riches, is clothing. Clothing was expensive. Clothing was a, a great commodity. It was given as gifts to show that you really appreciated someone, because, you know, basically, if you had... Uh, you know, your basic everyday one and a cloak that you could put on as a coat, you know, you were doing good. But the wealthy had many clothes. Clothes that were just sitting in the closet waiting to be worn. 
and the moths were coming in and eating them away. Again, more than they needed. That's, that's the point of what he's saying here. It's not just that they had these things, but they had it in abundance. So it was just sitting around. And so the clothing was getting eaten up rather than being shared with those who really had need of that clothing. And lastly, he's talking about your gold and silver are corroded. Now, gold and silver doesn't corrode. Um, some of the coins would tarnish a little bit, but it really wouldn't corrode. But that was the idea, again, that the coins are just sitting around. You've got so much wealth that it's just laying around. And rather than using it for good, you're just hoarding it selfishly. That's what he's speaking about. Riches where you're just storing it up selfishly and don't care about other people. And that's the kind that's going to be weeping and wailing. That's the kind who is, is oppressing the poor, oppressing their workers, and not even paying them their daily wage on time. And the weeping and the, and the crying out to the Lord has reached his ears. You see, you've got to understand that most of the time in that day, there were day laborers that went out and worked the fields. And they got their wages at the end of that day. And that wages is what fed that family for that evening and the next day until the next day came along and they got work again. They lived literally day to day. And if a, work, and if a, a boss, uh, an owner, did not pay them, they went hungry because they didn't have anything to buy food with. So there would be a lot of crying out to God about that. And so here they are. They've got all this food and all this wealth that they're just hoarding. And then what are they doing? Oppressing the poor even further by not even paying them what they're owed. Those are the ones that are going to be weeping and wailing. And again, it's, it's mindful of, of something that Jesus shared back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. Again, if you want to turn back there with me, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. And then we will see the video. <laughs> Matthew 6, 19 through 21. If the Lord wills. If the Lord wills. <laughs> Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Sound familiar? And where thieves break in and steal. See, here's the other issue that James didn't deal with, but that Jesus had. And that is that you can lose it by people stealing it. It's not doing you any good. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So watch this video. The funeral seemed just like any funeral I've had in the past. But then I saw something strange. As the hearse approached the cemetery, I noticed it was pulling a U-Haul trailer. That's right, a U-Haul trailer. And the trailer contained the most precious items that the deceased had accumulated throughout his life. It was his will that they be buried with him, so along with the casket, the entire trailer was lowered into the ground and buried. Well, this sight caused me to think for some time about life and the many things that we work to earn for ourselves. It's, it's so foolish how we will work so hard for temporal pleasure, money, positions, houses, land, things, stocks, and investments. But you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. You can't, you can't take it with you. So the point that James and Jesus both are trying to make is that we need to be using our wealth for the benefit of others, not just selfishly hoarding it only for ourselves. I remember uh, reading a story of a woman who, uh, whose husband was very wealthy and her, whose husband was about to die. And he knew he was about to die. And he wanted to take it with him. And so he made his wife promise that she would take all of his money, gather all of his money together, and bury him with his money. And he made her promise that she would do that. And finally, after arguing with him for you know, a long time about it, she finally, finally conceded. 
that she would bury him with all of his money. And so as the funeral was taking place and as they were just about to close the casket, she wrote out a check for all the money that he owned and put it in the, in the casket with him. Buried him with all of his possessions, all of his money. Smart lady, smart lady. If he can cash it, the check deserves to bounce, but she did what she promised. We can't take our wealth and our possessions with us, but we need to be storing up treasures in heaven through the good deeds that James has been talking about earlier in this chapter. We need to be thinking about others rather than being so selfish with everything that we possess, our abilities, our time, our money. It's, it's all of it. It's not just our money. Let's continue on. Verse 7. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the, Lord, uh, how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider, as you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. We need to be patient with the Lord. You see, back then, they really had a concept that Jesus was returning at any time. They really thought that in their lifetime, Jesus would be returning. And started, they were starting to grumble and complain when Jesus wasn't returning. And, and the persecution was starting against the church. And they were getting concerned, and so they were grumbling and complaining. And James is trying to address that particular issue with them and saying, look, be patient. Look at the farmer who has to wait for the crops. Look at the prophets who were patient. Look at Job, who's a classic example of patience. We need to be patient. The Lord will come, but he will come when he is ready to come, and not a moment sooner. So we need to be patient because Jesus will come, and he will reward those who patiently wait for him. And then in verse 12, he says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. James kind of does this. He'll, he'll get on a little line and all of a sudden he'll just sort of insert a little gem every once in a while. And here's one of those little gems of wisdom that he throws in there. That we should not be swearing by anything, but just simply let our yes be yes and our no, no. Let a reputation stand for itself. And again, reminiscent of, of Jesus' words back in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 36. Matthew 5, 33 through 36. Jesus says again, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now he wasn't aware of Lady Claire all there, where you can make your white hair black, but that's beside the point, okay? Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Let your word be for itself. See, you don't need to swear by an oath. You know what? Whenever I hear someone say, I swear, or, you know, trust me, believe me, I, I swear on my mother's grave, you know, whenever they have to say something else to try to make you to believe them, I disbelieve them. <laughs> I tend not to believe what they're saying. Because if they've got to come up with something to try to convince someone, then they probably have not been very truthful in their lifetime. 
and they need something else to try to prove to you that they are telling the truth. And that's what Jesus is saying. Just simply be truthful without the needs of any oaths. Simply get your yes, be yes, and your no, no. Let's continue on. 13 through 18. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly and that, that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the, and the earth produced its crops. So, if you're in trouble, what does he say that we should do? Pray. If you're in trouble, pray. And if you're happy, if things are going well, what are you supposed to do? Sing praises to him. And if you're sick, what are we to do? Call together the elders of the church and pray. Let them anoint you with oil and pray. Now the oil has no magic healing power. The oil is simply a, a representation of the Spirit of God. That's all the oil is. Now oil back in that day again did have some medical uh, purposes that they used oils for. But that's not the main thing that he's talking about here. He's talking about that we're calling down the Spirit of God and His healing power because it's not the prayer that heals. It's not the people that are praying that heals. God heals. God heals. But it's the prayer of the righteous, of the faithful, that does appeal to God. And He will then consider doing that healing. Remember I said, consider that healing. Again, it's not a magic formula that if we do call the right people together and if we do anoint with oil and we do pray for that healing, you're guaranteed of healing. It doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, those of us in the church sometimes have, have taken that in the wrong way, taken this verse in the wrong way and have then accused the person that didn't have the healing take place of having some unconfessed sin, because he talks about confessing sin. You see, that's important, though. We need to be right with God, and we need to be right with our fellow man to be expecting God's blessing on our life in any way. We need to be right with God and with other people. And so perhaps we do need to confess to God sins in our life, and perhaps we do need to confess wrongs that we have done to others to help allow God's healing blessing to come our way. But is that a guarantee that when someone doesn't get healed, nah, you either had the wrong people healing, or praying for you, they weren't faithful enough, or you've got some sin in your life, that's why you didn't get healed. Sometimes God doesn't heal. And that's just the way it is. And that's his will. And we need to submit to that will. And so, please, again, even though that's important, the confession part of it, calling the elders together to pray for you, that is important, but that doesn't mean that the opposite is necessarily true. That if there is no healing that comes, that there's something wrong on behalf of the person who was doing the praying. But we do need to take the point that we need to be forgiven by God and by others to expect God's blessing in our lives as well. And then let's conclude with the last two verses. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. This really is the letter, the reason for James' letter. To kind of give us a letter of rebuke and to bring us back. He's trying to address some things that people in the church had been doing. They had evidently been 
not as faithful to God as they needed to be. They hadn't been controlling their tongue as well as they needed to be. They had been causing some troubles and some griefs within the church, and he was addressing all of those issues. And this is a rebuke that he is using to bring those who had wandered from the truth back to the truth. And it's also a, a commission, I guess you would call it, to us Christians. That when we see people wander from the truth, we are to be a vessel to bring them back to that truth. Now how does that relate to earlier when he was saying don't judge people? It has to do with our purpose. Remember how I said how we're to confront people? We're to do it with love, we're to do it with compassion, we're to do it with care, we're to do it with kindness. When we're trying to bring someone back to the faith, if we're just sitting there just lambasting them about what we see in their life and we're just wanting to get something off of our chest to try to just you know, make them feel bad, that's not going to help them. But if we're sincerely coming to them and saying, we see this happening in your life and we're concerned about you and we love you and we care about you and we want to bring you back to the right relationship with the church, that you don't have right now. God will be blessed by that. And you will be blessed by that. And God will take that into account on your behalf. It'll be another crown in your thorn. Or no, a, a jewel in your crown. A crown in your thorn? A jewel in your crown that he wants to put into your life. Another treasure that you've brought up and kept in heaven for you if we do it in the right way, and if we do it with the right motive and the right purpose. I hope the letter of James has spoken to you. It's a, it's a powerful book with a lot of wonderful wisdom for us on how we should live as Christians. And I'm thankful that I, I pastor a church that doesn't have a lot of the problems that James is addressing. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be reminded of those things that we need to be concerned about and warned about. We need to live a life of holiness before God, and he will bless us. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the book of James, and we thank you for his wisdom, and, and we thank you for this book that we can study. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless us, that you will use us, and that we will do the good deeds, not be so selfish, but do the good that we need to do for others, to show our faith is meaningful and not a dead faith. Bless us and use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.